All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, today I'm, I want to show you four things that are not in the Bible. And it's kind of hard to show you something that's not in the Bible, but I'll, I'll try my best. All right, so the first thing that I want to show you is that there is no angel babies. Okay, so I know a lot of people, about 99.9% .9 roughly, perhaps more, of the teachers today teach this idea that there are angel babies and that's simply not in the Bible anywhere at all if you look at for example Genesis chapter 6 you notice that there is no mention at all of angels alright not a single oh wait yeah there is it says right there one Where's it at? Oh, where's it at? Well, that's weird, isn't it? Where's the Where's the angel at? Where's this at? Okay, <laughs> that's kind of odd, isn't it? Because it's not. Is it referring to me typing that? Or is it just weird? Um, I, I don't know what to say here. Because the word angel is not here in Genesis 6. Alright. Um, you can look at it for yourself. It's not there. It's not anywhere. It's not anywhere at all. Alright, so anyways. Um... What what is here is that the the sons of God, right? And you consider Adam was the son of God, and the sons of Adam were also sons of God. And but now today, we that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we that are born of God, we are now the sons of God. All right. So I, you know, I just did a video recently over this. Yeah, there's not a whole lot more I need to say about it. Um, in First John, First John, chapter three, verse two, beloved, now are we the sons of God, right? So there are no angel babies. There's nothing at all that indicates. I mean, you think about this here. Think about it this way try to make it easy for somebody to kind of, because it's really important um, you don't want some goofy doctrine that doesn't make any sense that's talking you know that teaches this idea of sex you don't want to get that wrong really here consider this in Luke chapter 3 verse 38 Adam was the son of God now in Genesis chapter 6 we see that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all which they chose so they the sons of God were procreating with the daughters of men of course the daughters of men the daughter belongs to her father until her father gives her in marriage okay and so they were taken wives of all which they chose now Adam son of God he was having children he was he was commanded to have children and to be fruitful and to multiply upon the earth and and that's exactly what they did Adam was not the only one commanded to be fruitful and multiply right all the sons of Adam also had children all right and this is all this is referring to it is no mention at all of angels it had and no mention at all of angels period let alone the idea of angels having sex and procreating and all this and that and then even Jesus himself says that in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven and then the resurrection happens at the end of this world right and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth right and, and then 
in uh, 1 John chapter 2, John specifically writes that the world passes away and the lust thereof. So there is no sex in the world to come. And angels do not have sex, period. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. So this idea of angel babies is not supported anywhere at all in the Bible. It's simply not anywhere. Okay? Number two, 70 AD. That's another one that I can't, I can't, I mean, I, I got four of them here on the list. I could probably have more, but I'm just going to stick with four. But I, it's, it, it's not something I can show you and say, hey, look, it's not there. It's just not there. It stems from um, false teaching, false doctrines. All right, so in the case of 70 AD, all right, it's all solely based on the idea that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and not 33 AD which this prophecy is clearly speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the one that laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice and offering to God he's the one that caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease until the consummation which is his return when he comes in the clouds of heaven and we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air we are changed behold I show you a mystery we should not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord this is the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 all right Jesus is the one that makes an end of sins he's the one that makes reconciliation for iniquity and he's the one that brings in everlasting righteousness he he's the one all right so this prophecy is about him and then he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease when he laid down his life as the perfect offering to God for our sins. He did it. It's about him. Now, people that teach 70 AD, they're completely rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. They're teaching a foreign religion that does not square with the Word of God. All right, number three, seven-year tribulation. Again, I cannot show you anywhere that talks about this uh, seven year tribulation okay, okay. <laughs> I can't do it uh, it's just not it's not anywhere at all but I can show you the idea is um, nuts completely nuts and you got to completely disregard the Bible for for one example Matthew 24 um, we read Jesus is asked what is the sign of thy coming of the end of the world and then Jesus tells us hey these things are gonna happen but don't be afraid it's not the end yet and then he says here in, in verse 29 the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of him in heaven now it's, it says it as plain as can be immediately after the tribulation so all this that we're reading here is worldly tribulation all right, Jesus says, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right? In the world you shall have tribulation. Here in Matthew 24, we read about tribulation of all sorts. And then after the tribulation. After the tribulation signifies that there will be no more tribulation after this. All right, so this is, has to be the end of the world. It has to be judgment. It has to be the great, terrible day of the Lord. And it is, of course, because Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up into the air, and our enemy is destroyed at our feet. And this stems from a prophecy that goes all the way back 
to Genesis chapter 3, when the Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the Lord up in the air, stomping his foot on the head of the serpent, putting an end to evil forever. All right? That's the prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. That's the hope, the promise, all the good stuff, man, that we're going to do away with evil forever. And we're going to be in a world of uh, perfection, you know, with no sin. A world without death. A world without sorrow. A world without pain. That's what we're putting our hope into. And so people that teach this idea of a seven-year tribulation, um, they're putting their hope into, or think about it this way, they're preaching that this tribulation will come after Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven. In other words, when Jesus comes, it's not the end of the world. It's not a world of... Um, you know, perfection. Not a, it's not a world without death. It's going to be a world of great tribulation, and that's what they that's what they teach. A whole lot of people. There will be great tribulation, and there will be the mark of the beast. There will be the antichrist, and all this sort of stuff is going to come after the end of the world, and it's insanity. All right, it's insanity. Now, um. So, okay, so there is no tribulation, period. No seven-year, I'm sorry, no, there's no seven-year tribulation. I, I can't show you, look, seven-year tribulation is not there because it's not there. I can't show it to you. It's just simply not there. Man, you, if I offered you a million dollars, you wouldn't be able to show it to me because it's just simply not found in the Word of God, in the Scripture at all. Yet yeah, people teach it. Well, they teach it because it... Because they don't want to, they don't want to know the truth. It's that simple. They don't care about the truth. They don't want to know the truth. And then again, uh, there's no millennial reign. Period. I can't show you uh, that it's not in the Bible, but I can show you that this stems from this idea of a thousand years that we read about in. Revelation 20, and, and if, if, if anybody were honest, they would admit that this idea is not shared anywhere at all, this idea of a, of a millennial reign. The, they say it's in Revelation 20, but then it's not, and then if they're honest, they'll admit it's not, this idea is not shared anywhere else. In the entire Bible, I know people like those. Oh, Isaiah this and Isaiah that. It's it's not in Isaiah either. Hey, you're completely being dishonest when you try to draw a parallel from with this to Isaiah. This idea of a millennial reign after the end of the world. All right. When you try to draw a parallel to anywhere in Isaiah or anywhere in the Bible, you're not being honest about it. Period. And it's odd because they'll point to scripture that talks about the life to come hereafter, after the resurrection. The, uh, the life where there is no sin. The life where there is peace. And they'll say, well, that's for a thousand years. So the idea that they teach is that there will be paradise for a thousand years and the problem obviously is that I don't I don't want anything to do with that and I don't know why you would either you can take that thousand years of peace and throw it in the garbage can I don't want it I want everlasting life a thousand years is a flash in a pan why would I put my hope into a thousand years of peace? That's nothing. 
I want eternal life. And it's in, it's just weird. It's weird. Why would you even bother to teach this? Why would you even believe in Jesus Christ if it was for only a thousand years of peace? It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. And so here in Revelation 20, we see that, hey, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand. It's not Christ reigning a thousand years. It's those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They live and reign with Christ. All right, it, it it's incredible. How, how did they? How do so many people miss it? Oh, well, Christ reigns a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. Except, it never says Christ reigns a thousand years. It's incredible, really. Luke chapter. One says that Jesus reigns forever, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So how do you teach this idea? Well, Jesus reigns a thousand years. What? Well, right here it says he reigns forever. Just from a logical standpoint, why would you say, hey, Jesus reigns a thousand years? And you, so you're putting your hope into a thousand years, and this is where I put want to push people to say, hey, why would you want to believe in a thousand years? What happens during this thousand years? Oh, people, I'll be having sex. I mean, if you're being honest, that's what, why the sole reason why they teach that, the sole reason. And of course, we're warned of this, and it, being warned of this, we know it's going to happen, and we see it happening right now. And in First Peter or Second Peter chapter three, it, he writes, "Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. These people are preaching doctrines of lust, and they are scoffing the word of God. They don't believe it. They don't believe the Bible they hold in their hands, and they're inwardly." mocking and scoffing those of us that do. All right, they're trying to make fun very subtly of those of us that actually believe the Bible we hold in our hands. It's pretty incredible. All right, so again, in John chapter 11, Jesus says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this? And here in Revelation 20, it says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. The second death has no power over us right now that are born of God. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. We shall never die right now. Right now we have everlasting life and the second death has no power over us right now. Right? And right now we are priests of God Again, we can go to First Peter, chapter two. First Peter, chapter two, and read that we are a kingdom of priests. We are a royal priesthood. Excuse me, a royal priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. We are the holy nation of God. Right now, holy nation, and this also stems from. Exodus 19 right that we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation right which in time past were not a people but now are we the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy because of the Lord Jesus Christ and remember he said the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof we are that holy nation all right so I mean it's pretty obvious no? Pretty obvious that we are the priest of God and of Christ. And of course, if that wasn't enough, well, heck, you should have read the first chapter of the book of Revelation. I don't know how you miss it. Really, I don't. I really don't know how you miss it. And verse 6, Jesus Christ has made us kings and priests unto God. No, what, you forget about that? 
it kind of screws with your doctrine a little bit, doesn't it? Because right now we are priests of God. <clears throat> right now. And so here we read that the rest of the dead live not again. Well, that kind of screws. If you actually read this, the rest of the dead lived not again. Lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So they, the resurrection doesn't happen until after the thousand years. So these people that are teaching this idea that the resurrection occurs before the thousand years, they have to blindly read that, don't they? It's like it's not even on the pa on the page. It's like they have no comprehension. They can't see it. Even though it's right there, they can't see it. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished, until after, after the thousand years. And of course, um, this is the first resurrection. In John chapter 11, Jesus plainly says, I am the resurrection. I, mean, I don't know how you missed that. Did, have you not gotten that far yet? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is the first resurrection. You didn't know that? If you didn't know that, why are you t trying to teach Revelation 20? You don't even understand it yourself. 1 Corinthians 15. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first roots, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. See, Jesus is the first fruits. You think there's a bunch of Christ's or something? A whole group of, you got Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Aquaman, all this. You think those are the first fruits? What is it, man? What is it? Afterward, they that are Christ, that is coming. No, it's just Jesus. Jesus is the first fruits, and we are partakers of his resurrection. And then when he returns, we will be lifted up, resurrected into the air to meet the Lord. <clears throat> so shall we ever be <clears throat> with the Lord? Excuse me. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ, that is coming. So we're not resurrected until after he comes in the clouds of heaven. But Christ is the first fruits. He's resurrected. He is the resurrection. So you read Revelation 20, you can't figure it out. It's incredible. But of course, when you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, you deserve to believe to be delusional. You deserve it. And that when well, that's in the Bible too. Alright. So anyways, all these things are not in the Bible. These four things. I could have made a longer list, but I thought, let's just make a, a short list here today and talk about them because I talk too much anyway. Isaiah 66, verse 4, I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. These four things are not in the Bible, period. But these are four commonly taught things in the world today, which really should serve as signs that the end is really getting pretty close. Because it seems to me that almost nobody actually believes the Bible they hold in their hands.